The BTR-80 is a Soviet amphibious armored personnel carrier which can move on both land and water and is used to transport soldiers. It came after the BTR-70 and BTR-60 models and its creation was influenced by the war in Afghanistan. However, the design didn't change much from the older models. The BTR-80 has the usual layout with three main sections. The driver and commander sit in the front, the soldiers and gunner are in the middle and the engine is in the back. Everyone inside shares the same space and they use side doors to get out, which is a big improvement from the side hatches used in the BTR-70. Today's video isn't going to be about the history of the BTR-80, but instead we're going to take a detailed look at the gunner's position inside the BTR-80. So hello and welcome and enjoy this video. The gunner sits inside a small one-man turret. The turret has the same armor protection as the rest of the vehicle and weighs 540 kilograms when fully equipped. Its base, the turret ring, has a diameter of 1075 millimeters. The turret itself is pretty small and because of how the gunner's sight is positioned, his eyes are at the same height as the turret ring and only the top of his head is inside the turret. The KPVT machine gun, on the other hand, takes up most of the turret's length. This design means the gunner doesn't feel too cramped, especially since there is no turret basket around his seat. Talking about the seat, the gunner sits on a basic seat with a long cushion. His back wrist can be adjusted up and down and the seat itself can be moved forward, backward or raised or lowered. However, the seat isn't very comfortable for a long period since it has no padding and there is no footrest or anything to protect the gunner's legs when the turret spins. But the good thing is, because the seat is suspended above the floor, the gunner has a better chance of surviving if a landmine goes off underneath the vehicle, especially since he's positioned in the center of the BTR. The turret travel lock is near the gunner's left shoulder and if the BTR-80 has the 902V smoke grenade system, its control box is also next to this lock. The mechanism for opening and closing the shield for the 1PZ-2 site is located above and to the left of the site near the turret roof. For general visibility, the gunner only has two extra periscopes besides his main sight to see what's going on outside. There's one TNP-205 periscope next to the 1PZ-2 side for general vision and one TNP-T1 rear view prism above him on the turret ceiling. This limited setup means the gunner struggles to spot targets at close to medium distances and has a harder time detecting anything above the vehicle. However, this is not a big problem because finding the targets is the commander's job and he has enough observation devices to do that well. It's important to mention that the KPVT and PKT machine guns in the turret are balanced around their center of gravity, but when the ammo boxes are added, the whole setup becomes a bit heavier at the back. To fix this, a balancing spring was added which connects the top of the gun cradle to the turret ceiling. This helps the gunner raise the weapon smoothly with minimal effort. The gun's elevation and the turret's movement are controlled manually using two hand wheels. The hand wheel that moves the turret also has the triggers for firing the KPVT and PKTM machine guns. The electrical system for firing the guns is located below where the weapons are mounted. A gunner under the influence of nicotine and some vodka can move the turret pretty fast but the lack of powered movement and stabilization is still a downside. Since the BTR-80 is still in use today, many gunners have complained about not having powered turret movement as mentioned in the TV Zvesta interview. However, having a fully enclosed turret offers much better protection compared to an exposed machine gun mounted on the roof like on the M113 or earlier versions of the BTR-60. Talking about the eyes of the gunner, he uses a 1PZ-2 periscopic monocular sight which works for both day and night to see what's actually going on there, more or less. It has two zoom options, 1.2x for a wide field of view and 4x for a closer look. At 1.2, the field of view is 49 degrees and at 4, it's at 14 degrees. The side doesn't have its own stabilization system. It has a mirror which can tilt up to plus 81 degrees and down to minus 10 degrees 
but the gun the, but the guns themselves can only move up to plus 60 degrees and down to minus 4 degrees because of the turret's design. The sight is linked to the guns mechanically so it moves with them. This gun elevation is more than enough for the gunner to easily shoot at aircraft and adjust for targets on high ground, but to be fair, the sight isn't seen as great for tracking moving aircraft. It only has simple rings in the viewfinder to help with aiming. The same viewfinder is used for all types of targets, but the markings for ground targets are too small in the 1.2x zoom setting, and the anti-aircraft markings aren't visible in the 4x zoom. In practice, the 1.2 setting is mainly for shooting at aircraft or for less accurate shots at ground targets, while the 4x setting is used only for aiming at ground targets. The 1PZ2 sight is used to aim both the KPVT and the PKT and coaxial machine gun. Both are sighted for up to 2000 meters, but their actual effective range for accurate fire mostly depends on how long the tracer rounds can be seen. Without tracers, it's hard to adjust your aim because you can't really see where the bullets land at long distances. In general, the 7.62mm machine gun is effective up to 1000 meters against troops in open areas, but isn't useful against aircraft. The KPVT's maximum effective range is 1000 meters against lightly armored vehicles, 2000 meters against unarmored targets or infantry, and 1500 meters for slow, low, low flying aircraft. Lead and wind adjustments are made using the horizontal scale in the center of the side. There is a small horizontal bar above the scale that marks 500 meters for the KPVT and it lines up with the fixed horizontal line of the anti-aircraft rings. The horizontal scale can also be used to estimate distance, but for more accurate measurements the gunner needs help from the commander who has a stadiometric rangefinder in his TKN3 periscope. The sight has a built-in light which can be turned on to make the reticle visible in low light. The gunner can also adjust the contrast of the image by switching between two filters using a knob. A neutral filter is used for firing at ground targets, while a tinted filter is used when shooting at air targets or when aiming towards the sun. The sight comes with a basic night vision device which uses active infrared and works with the OU3GA 2M inferred spotlight. The spotlight at 1, 110 watts is strong enough for the gunner to spot and identify tank sized targets up to 400 meters away, but spotting smaller vehicles like APCs is harder. The same reticle for from the daytime view is used in night vision, but it's lit up by a green light inside the sight. This illuminated reticle can also be used in the daytime channel when fighting in low light conditions like during twilight. Overall the night vision on this side is pretty weak. It's not really competitive with other night vision devices and turning on the infra spotlight would probably give away the BTR's position to the enemy even faster. The 1PZ2 is a basic tool which does what it needs to do, but nothing extra. In terms of technology, it's stuck in the 1950s. That said, it's still more advanced than the older PP61A and periscopic sight that was used on the BTRs since the BTR60PB. Anyways, that was all I had to say for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you think I said anything that is not right or you think I should have added any additional information to this video, please let me know in the comments and share your knowledge. Besides that, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.